Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm really looking forward to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Matthias Greschel. I'm a resident physician in internal medicine at Charité University Hospital Berlin and a research fellow in biomedical informatics at Harvard Medical School. I welcome you to today's webinar by Alex Karagiris and David Cantor from Emil Commons on MedPerf, an open benchmarking platform for medical AI. This series, AI and Health within AI for Good, is an initiative of the Global Initiative on AI for Health that has just been launched this summer by the, by the WIPO, the WHO, and ITU, but is backed by more than 40 sister agencies of the United Nations. If you're interested in joining the effort, please let us know and contact us. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our co-moderator today, Louis Wala. Louis is head of machine learning at DotPhoton and is currently completing his PhD at the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin, Germany. His research efforts focus on data optimality, uncertainty quantification, and challenging the robustness of AI models. Louis, you can take it from here and introduce Alex and David. Thanks so much, Matthias. Um, yeah, this has been a while in the making, and I'm very happy we we actually made it here um, because we have uh, two true heavyweights uh, in the space of benchmarking and uh, AI for health uh, as a specialty. Um, first, David, uh, together with uh, Peter and others, he founded this uh, really um, interesting and I, I think we can already say successful organization not that long ago. Uh, ML Commons, I think, was launched in 2018. And if you are seeing any like big influential papers on performance benchmarking in machine learning, whether it's general models or whether it's medical models, as we will see later, um, they are behind this. So I'm really happy that uh, David made it. Uh, he's uh, executive director there and uh, has been building a, a fascinating community. So if you have questions about this, um, feel free to engage in the discussion. And afterwards, we will hear from Alex, who has been uh, tirelessly driving uh, the, the working group on medical AI um, within um, MLC, um, setting up the uh, benchmarking suit uh, called MedPerf. They also have done very interesting work on infrastructure and uh, foundation models. So um, that will be the second part. And at the end, uh, as usual uh, in these meetings, we will have an open discussion. Um, so uh, stick around to ask your questions. So, uh, David, uh, let's uh, get to you. Uh, can you share your screen and turn on your camera? And then we shut off and enjoy the show. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're going to break down this talk into two sections. I'm going to talk about ML Commons overall. And then uh, Alex is going to talk about <clears throat> sort of the specifics of the MedPerf project. So... Uh, for those who don't know, uh, ML Commons is a uh, global collaborative engineering organization focused specifically on ML. And we're very unique in this regard. Uh, you know, there's a ton of organizations that uh, are, are focused on AI, but very few of them do the sort of collaborative joint engineering uh, that we focus on. And, and likewise, there's many organizations uh, that do joint engineering work like IEEE and so forth, but, but very few or to none of them are, are specialists in AI and ML. And so, you know, we sort of uh, fill this void uh, and, and very specifically, that is what we focus on uh, is, you know, how can we do uh, collaborative collective engineering across industry and academia 
uh, across all of the different continents to make ML better for everyone, right? And so, you know, we are very much a global community. We've got members on six out of seven of the continents, and I'm always looking for someone at the McMurdo base who can join as a member. So if you're if you're calling in from Antarctica, contact me afterwards. Um, the other thing that's a little bit interesting is is when ML Commons started uh, with the ML Perf project, it was actually half academics and half industry folks at our first meeting, right? And that heritage we have maintained over time. We have a lot of phenomenal academics that we partner with uh, that help to lead uh, working groups or collaborate on different projects with, and that's very important to us. So, you know, we've got uh, over, uh, I think, uh, uh, 100 members these days. These are sort of the the uh, uh, paying members that you can see up here. And, you know, we're always looking uh, to expand uh, the community. So, uh, but again, our goal is how do we make ML better for everyone. And so I want to talk specifically about benchmarks here, right? And and how that is a venue for improving machine learning, right? Which is, I look at benchmarks in sort of two ways. And one is that they provide a barometer on progress, right? They help everyone come to consensus on what does it mean to be better? And when we started doing ML Perf, you know, it was almost as if you were purchasing a car and, and a bunch of people would come up to you and one would say, you know, my car goes uh, uh, 200 kilometers an hour. The next one would say, my car can stop uh, from 200 kilometers an hour to zero in, you know, a microsecond. And then the third guy says, my car has airbags, right? These are all, you know, impossible dimensions to compare across. Uh, but since I live in San Francisco, you know, I would say for me, the airbag is probably the most important thing. It's kind of hard to go 200 miles an hour in a major urban area. Right. But uh, by bringing the industry together, we can help align on what does it mean to be better. And so once you have a agreement on what it means to be better and you can start measuring these things, you can improve. Right. And anyone who has OKRs or goals has worked at a large company is familiar with this system, which is predicated on this idea. Right. You know, from from Peter Drucker. Right. And so I think of benchmarking as helping to bring clarity between buyers and sellers, between researchers and academics and practical engineers, software and hardware between the whole community. But it also helps the community align on where we want to go. And so, you know, as the as the picture sort of illustrates, the the key is when we are traveling together, when we align on what it means to be better, we go faster, we go farther and and we make machine learning much better for everyone. And, you know, benchmarks are not perfect, right? They, if you want to go true north, the reality is that benchmarks will probably get you, you know, maybe within 10 degrees. But since we're traveling together, the progress is that much faster. And you can always change your benchmarks over time as, you know, you sort of discover, uh, oh, you know, maybe you're 15 degrees off from true north. And that's the real path you want to go on, metaphorically speaking. So uh, part of the reason for uh, ML Perf is this fundamental facet of machine learning, which is that it's driven by big data, right? So this is um, a uh, image from a paper at Baidu Research uh, when Andrew Ng was running the lab. And uh, the two axes here are log scale. And so on the x-axis, we have the amount of training data. And then on the y-axis, we have generalized error. And so what you should really think about this as is, as the y-axis gets smaller, you get better AI. And at some point on this curve, you get these qualitative step functions and capabilities, right? And you know, uh, everyone is familiar with uh, AlexNet, which demonstrated for the first time that we could get AI that was about as good as humans at image recognition, right? And then somewhere else along this curve, right, you're gonna have self-driving cars are safer than humans, right? Things like that. Um, but what this curve really shows is that across a wide variety of machine learning uh, uh, algorithms and neural networks, the, the challenge is that a small amount of data doesn't help you. And that's what we had in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. We didn't have enough data. And so ML was not actually a useful tool. But once you get enough data, the error starts going down very rapidly and you get these new capabilities, right? And so this is really critical. We need big data 
to unlock these new ML capabilities and, and qualitatively improve our lives, right? That's the point of this slide. But if we have big data, we need to get big models, right? That can learn from that data. And so this is a chart from uh, Berkeley that shows the size of models in parameter count on the y-axis over time. And again, this is not a linear axis. This is, uh, you know, orders of magnitude here. And so the, the point is, if you look at it, sort of the most cutting edge models are growing in size about 250x every couple of years, right? Which is vastly eclipsing our ability to have more memory uh, for, you know, a given uh, processor, right? And so this poses a really big challenge. Um, those two facts together, right, that we want more data with more parameters uh, combine to mean that when it comes to compute, we actually need even more compute, right? So before we saw that the parameter count was increasing by 250x every two years for transformer-based models, like the large language models that you see, like GPT-3 and so forth. Um, again, similar chart from, from Berkeley, but it's 750x every two years for compute. So you know, the demand for compute is growing in an absolutely insatiable way that we need to unlock these new capabilities. So, you know, these stylized facts I sort of put together in, uh, uh, you know, sort of a TED Talk-esque equation, uh, which is I like to cheekily call the fundamental theorem of machine learning. Uh, my background's in math, and so this is a riff on the fundamental theorem of calculus or algebra. Right, but it's big data plus a big model plus big compute equals innovation. And so that is really what motivates performance benchmarks, right? And of course, a lot of this innovation is measured with quality benchmarks, right? Things like how accurate are you at image recognition? How good is a car at lane keeping, right? And so uh, benchmarks are fundamentally critical for uh, every uh, aspect of machine learning and driving and measuring progress. And so one of the things I want to point out is that by coming together, we can actually have a tremendous impact. So this is a chart that shows the performance on ML perf uh, imposed over Moore's law, right? Which is the, you know, classic progress in semiconductors. And that's this uh, Moore's law is this sort of salmon colored line at the bottom. Right, and, and what it shows is that since the beginning of uh, MLPerf, you would naively expect that performance would improve by about four and a half X. Well, okay, four and a half X is great, but that's obviously way, way lower than the 750 X. So we've got to do a lot better than that. But by coming together and improving architectures, improving larger systems, better software, new algorithms, what you can see is that we've been able to actually eclipse Moore's law significantly. You know, at our second round, we improved performance by 4x faster than Moore's law. And over time, you know, we're now at the point where, you know, again, looking back to the inception, uh, performance is somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 30 to 50x better uh, versus four and a half x better for Moore's law. So we're going 10x faster than Moore's law. And so that's part of uh, an illustration of the power of benchmarks is once you point everyone in the right direction, you uh, begin, everyone starts using every lever at their disposal to increase this performance, which translates into more capabilities for researchers and the broader community. So, uh, and you know, the benchmarks are also serving as a barometer on progress here. So that is why we do benchmarks. And, uh, you know, again, the goal is how do we make ML better for everyone? Uh, one of the things that I get to now pass it over to Alex, um, so Alex, you might want to share your screen shortly, uh, is, you know, part of the formula I outlined here is essentially that there's a huge amount of data, and when you can get it together, you build more powerful ML algorithms. But in the medical space, this is uniquely challenging. And so Alex is going to talk about, you know, our, our thinking in this area about how we can harness the power of big data for medicine in a way that really benefits us all. So thanks. And I'll be back for the Q&A. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And thank you, setting the stage for the benchmark. So let me share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. 
Yes, Alex, looks good. good. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, let's talk about network, like, uh, you know, uh, David mentioned. Um, ML Commons is about best practices and benchmarks. So within ML Commons, uh, there's the medical working group that has been focusing on benchmarking machine learning for medical AI. So over the past two years, a group has been developing MedPerf, an open source software platform that aims to improve the impact of medical AI through benchmarking. And in the next few slides, we will be talking about the importance and impact of this technology to the healthcare space. I would like to just provide some context first. Um, we have all seen how AI has taken the world by storm. Healthcare is not an exception as well. Um, from designing new drugs to detecting Alzheimer's and breast cancer, AI has demonstrated its potential uh, to advance healthcare delivery in unprecedented ways. However, reality is much different. Um, medical AI models are often great in the lab where you know, researchers develop it, but when deployed in the real world, they fail due to lack of extensive validation, highlighting you know, the risks of bias, healthcare, uh, health inequality, and underperformance. So therefore, there is AI models need more diverse data in order to be validated extensively and subsequently to be improved. Uh, however, as we, many of us know here, healthcare data are very difficult to share due to technical, regulatory, and privacy issues. So this is uh, leading to a slower adoption of AI in healthcare. So to address you know, these important issues, our medical working group has laid out a vision to create an open community of experts on building tools to evaluate medical AI on real world data while protecting patient privacy. Uh, and as you know, David showed, we are you know, a group of industry and academics experts. We believe that a robust evaluation can help with broader adoption and greater innovation of AI in healthcare. To accommodate this vision, the group has been developing MedPerf. So MedPerf, as I said in the beginning, is an open source software platform that relies basically on five uh, pillars. First, evaluation of AI models within the premises of the data providers, hospitals. Second, protect patient information by enforcing no access to the patient data. Third, supports the development of best practices to improve and streamline AI evaluation. Fourth, it facilitates access to global diverse patient data. And fifth, it enforces that activities are monitored and controlled by humans. So we have a human in the loop. So in a nutshell, through these pillars with MedPath, we aim to, to, to for neutrality, transparency, and accountability. And to demonstrate to you how MedPath works in very simple you know, example, uh, let's jump on this uh, hypothetical scenario. So let's say a research institution somewhere in Europe develop an AI model that detects brain tumor on MRI images. Let's say that the model was trained with limited patient data from the local hospital or local sites, right? The model can perform great on that population, of course, because that, that's where it was trained from. Now, thanks to MedPerf, the performance of that model can be evaluated across diverse data in the world. Uh, the model can be evaluated in a hospital in the United States, as you can see on the left. Notice that the model you know, is sent to the hospital and no data leaves the premises of that hospital. Just you know, reiterating what I said before. So in this way, MedPerf makes sure that it alleviates concerns uh, with privacy and privacy. The process is supervised by humans, as I said, uh, the, person, the, the person in the hospital is in charge uh, and needs to approve the evaluation and then approve also the results back to the benchmark. So then the model can be deployed in other parts of you know, the world like Chile, you know, Chile uh, Australia, uh, and you name it. And the, you know, the process can be extremely powerful um, as it can help identify situations of underperformance and potential bias, like I said in the beginning. Uh, these performance drops can be attributed to various indicators, such as difference in you know, patient populations, 
uh, operating procedures, different scanners of, you know, that acquired, you know, the images. All of this could be trivial uh, difference, but can throw the model off, right? And there are indicators that the, you know, the model should be evaluated. Um, now that we have seen how MedPerf works, I just wanna take a moment and highlight the benefits of MedPerf for its potential stakeholders in healthcare. So first of all, we start with the AI researchers. For them, they have the opportunity to test the performance of the models in real world data. And not just you know, small lab controlled uh, you know, settings like the lab or the local uh, hospital. They can help you know, identify shortcomings of their models and help you know, improve those models and innovate. Uh, they can further you know, monitor the performance of those models once they are deployed in the hospitals. For the healthcare data providers, Medref can help them identify which models perform the best. It also ensures that the data never leaves the premises and they're not directly accessed. For patients, which is important to include always, you know, the patients, they have the opportunity to have a stronger voice and participate in defining a clinically meaningful benchmarks. They can also participate in shaping those metrics that affect overall clinical outcomes. So basically describe, you know, uh, outcomes that affect directly, you know, the patients. So they have a voice. Um, and finally, regulatory authorities can utilize an open source technical infrastructure like MedPerf uh, to capture, you know, basically um, guidelines related to, you know, uh, regulations. And basically with MedPerf, you know, it ensures that, you know, embodies transparency and neutrality, right? That supports, you know, their institutional role. So what have we done so far? Uh, so MedPerf has been used to support the largest real-world federated study to date, and that is, you know, the Federated Tumor Segmentation Challenge. Uh, MedPerf was facilitated uh, for the benchmark of 41 plus uh, medical AI models across 30 uh, hospitals worldwide. In addition, uh, MedPerf was tested on public and private data through medical research efforts across various organizations, like you can see Dana Farber, uh, Strasbourg. Um, and Harvard, and uh, the clinical problems we, you know, we benchmark were related to oncology, surgical AI, and radiology. Um, so this year, 2023 and moving to 2024, MedPerf is gonna support an exciting project of the Federated Tumor Segmentation Initiative, uh, or FETS, and this initiative started in 2018. It's part of, you know, it's NIH funded uh, joint research project by Penn Medicine and Intel and it's driven by a community of medical researchers across the world. And uh, the FEDS initiative is launching the next experiment, which will use MedPerf platform to coordinate across uh, the growing federation of over 70 hospitals around the world. This experiment was commissioned by the Response Assessment in Neuro-Oncology Working Group, which is known to clinicians as RAINO, and it's responsible for developing and testing new methods for evaluating neuro-oncology treatments. Uh, Reynolds sets you know, the widely accepted standard for brain tumor response assessments. In other words, the outcomes of this experiment could help set new standards in how we determine the success and failure of brain tumor treatments. This is led by Duke University, and Emil Cohen is gonna support uh, this experiment and this clinical study along with Penn Medicine and Intel and involves medical institutions from six uh, continents. Um, our goal is for the combination of uh, MedPerf and FEDS to enable many such clinical studies 2024 and beyond, and expand you know, beyond to neuro oncology and medical imaging modality. And just to give you an idea how many people are involved, since the inception, you know, almost two years ago, the group, the group has grown to include participants from global organization, its organization, of course, has contributed in various forms uh, from, you know, engineering resources all the way to data and, you know, uh, advisory. And I want to finish, you know, uh, my presentation with highlighting that MedPerf is a community-driven effort. Um, without participation of a diverse, you know, group of experts, 
might would not you know be what it is right now. Uh, therefore, we need a community of experts, right, who span from healthcare stakeholders, patient advocacy groups, AI researchers, regulatory organizations, and we want to make sure you know we align our effort with the interests of all these groups. And I just want to finish this with some um, special thanks to Jana Farber for helping me you know with uh, uh, MedPerf and Data uh, Topic in our Cancer in Hospital in the United States. Uh, Google for the technical leadership, uh, and uh, of course Intel for the technical leadership of MedPerf, UPenn for initiating all these efforts and supporting FEDS, uh, the first uh, federated tumor segmentation challenge. And um, that concludes my presentation. Thanks so much, Alex. I think David and uh, Luis, you can also turn on your videos. And now we have plenty of time for discussion. Um, and yeah, my first question is, um, how, how can we now seeing this as sort of a researcher, how can we, how can anyone contribute to MedPerf and MLcoms? Maybe you can outline this for, for the audience. Maybe you want to go first with MLcoms, yes. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think it sort of depends on your area of interest. So uh, I didn't have it up there, but uh, ML Commons has something like 15 or 16 active projects ranging from training benchmarks to, uh, we were recently asked by folks in the automotive industry to produce uh, automotive inference benchmarks for, you know, uh, intelligent vehicles, right? And so I think part of it is there's so much there. It's a matter of finding what aligns with your interests. Um, many of our working groups are, are open to anyone. Uh, MedPerf is an example of that. Some of them are uh, members only, uh, in order to uh, enable ML Commons to support all of these uh, groups. But I think, you know, part of it is kind of show up. We have public mailing lists. We have a Discord server. We're we're a very open and 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 friendly community. Um, and I think it's especially easy if there's a project that aligns with your interests. Um, you know, if there's not, and and you have a great project that you think makes sense for ML Commons to do. Uh, I would be, you know, I, I always encourage folks to bring those up. We do have community meetings in the Bay Area and uh, once a quarter, and we're looking at, you know, now that travel's a little bit easier, doing some of those abroad. But yeah, you can mention ideas to us, although we are somewhat limited in our our, our bandwidth. So um, th that's kind of from my so, angle. Alex, you want to talk about MedPerf? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, as David said, you know, our group is an open group, so... You just you can join. We have everything you know on GitHub. You can contribute yeah. uh, to it. Uh, you know tickets. We have a Discord like you can contribute as well. All our meetings are open, documented, free. That is exactly like what you know we're pursuing here: collaboration across all the different you know uh, spectrum. So if I'm let's say if, if I'm interested in sort of building models to predict um, antibi antibiotic resistance in bacterial genomes, which might be sort of a you know, the type of data that you have not yet in your sort of right. benchmark suite, I could sort of, um, as a researcher, work with you and set up the infrastructure, the documentation that others can use it for future publications. Okay. Right. Yeah. And the, the one thing I'd emphasize is when it comes to MedPerf, I wouldn't think of it as us having the data because we don't, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the vision for MedPerf is you know, we want researchers to sort of uh, Amazon one click their way into accessing a large amount of data that's within the community. Uh, now, technically, I think that's a lot easier done than legally. But, uh, you know, I think our strategy has always been let's put the technology in place and then use that to motivate uh, a, a legal discussion. Because ultimately, it's, you know, how do we make life for ML researchers and people? you know, who are going to bring medicine into everyone's hands easier and lower, lower friction. Yeah. Hey, Luis, you want to take the next question? I'll monitor for audience questions in the meantime. Um, so I, I want to, you know, push this matchmaking. Okay. I think we lost Luis here. I I don't know what he was gonna ask. Matchmaking. Do you know what he was going to ask? I I know the the song from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> <laughs> if, um, 
if not, I'll bring forward a question from uh, Jakob Willem, uh, the audience. Sure. He says, great project. I was wondering about curating data quality. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he's mentioning that like uh, when, you know, going through public databases, there is a big number of mislabeled data yeah. enough to sort of yeah cap accuracy of models. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I can take that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is a this is very, this is very true, right? Uh, data quality is important. And this is exactly one of the reasons that we are pursuing to make sure that the data we kind of help, you know, our benchmark uh, based organizer build are, you know, very good quality. So in order to do that, uh, we are basically are building, well, like you saw, you know, the, on this project with uh, the Reno group, we're enforcing a quality assessment when it comes to, you know, basically uh, annotations. And it's, uh, you know, a little bit even harder than usual because we, as, you know, David said, we don't get access to the data. All data is distributed within yeah. inside, you know, the, the hospitals. So we have to do a distributed, what we call, you know, annotation. In order to do that, you need to make sure, you know, the, the uh, you need to do kind of some quality assessment of, you know, the uh, labels, right? So we have in place right now, um, this, you know, sanity, if you want to call about it, that you check basically the quality. But of course, uh, from our experience, we have seen that many times when you run, you know, a model in a federation, you start seeing, you know, kind of weird drops in the performance that might not be attributed to the model itself, yeah. uh, but to the data itself, right? So you can pinpoint why specific, you know, data points are, you know, off, and then you can review them and you can see that, it was a really bad annotation, you know, task that. I don't know if that so, answers a little bit of the question. One of the things I would say is outside of the medical domain. Uh, so we do have some projects that are very much aimed at how do we increase the performance of ML by uh, looking at data more carefully. So that we have this uh, paper, I'm thrilled to be an author on it, uh, it's DataPerf. And it sort of takes your classic ML competition and turns it on its head, right? The classic ML competition is I give you a data set, please find the model that maximizes accuracy, right? And, yeah. you know, uh, we're big believers in data-centric AI. And so what we actually did is said, okay, let's give you a basket of models for a task, let's say computer vision. And now we're going to give you a data set and allow you to manipulate the data set. So maybe you could do different pre-processing, different class balances, and look at how that maximizes the accuracy, because ultimately, I think those are the tools that actually have the greatest impact. And so, you know, you could also think about, on one hand, I've, I've said that benchmarking is central to my organization. We're doing a lot of work in data. You could also think about putting those two things together and thinking about how do you actually benchmark the data itself, right? right. Uh, you know, it's kind of similar in some sense to, to the field of active learning. I think there's a lot of, of value there. So um, if you, that's your interest, we've got a working group for you too. Well, that's, that's exciting. And I and then this sort of also speaks to um, really understanding how adversarial attacks, for example, or data shift, data drift can impact your model accuracy, especially in the hospital context, right? So you can you can really estimate and quanti quantify yeah, how, how that affects your model's accuracy. That's really great. <laughs> Louis, another try. We... Weren't sure if you're sort of alluding to a Fiddler song or two, <laughs> two, two for two. Let, let's see if my <laughs> session stays uh, alive this time. So what I was trying to say is uh, not to push this matchmaking, you know, too hard. Uh, we're mm -hmm. just, you know, connecting, starting to connect dots here. But what I'm really curious about is how we can leverage this really impressive work um, that MLC is doing, and I think in terms of industry, in terms of results, the receipts are there. It's, it's I think, yeah, it's a very uh, active and lively community. And on the other hand, we have um, these groups that uh, Matthias also mentioned in the beginning, um, the global initiative with WHO, which has arguably been, I think, a bit slower on the, um, uh, on the infrastructure side, but has been very successful in kind of touring the globe and building up a diverse kind of stakeholder group. So we have members um, who work in AI and health um, in Africa, in, in South America, in Asia. And I, I'm just uh, yeah, thinking out loud, like how could we connect these two things? David, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
No, you're you're absolutely right. Like as an organization, we're at our best, you know, building. And I think there are other organizations that are actually much better at 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 at, at constructing a really broad community and constituency. And so I think there is a natural opportunity for for partnering there, particularly, you know, I think about something like MedPerf focused on federated evaluation. Part of the value is the size of the federation and the reach. So I think, you know, getting more folks engaged is there is is absolutely a natural thing. And also, you know, uh, helping us understand sort of capabilities and areas of interest. So, you know, when we started out, um, uh, we focused on on radiology and sort of images. And, and, you know, one of the things we found is, you know, some great success, thanks to Alex and other folks. But then Alex gave me a call a couple, you know, like a month ago, and he said, hey, there's a radiology group, they're meeting in Utah, you know, and, and he's in Europe. So that's that's a really long flight for a weekend. And he said, can you go? And so, you know, I think a part of this is as we build momentum, we're going to discover how we can work with different folks and what's truly valuable, uh, right? Because I mean, the other aspect is not not every uh, uh, aspect of machine learning is really ready for this. You know, I, I talked to a doctor once and he's like, I want to look at a patient record and then figure out what they're most at risk of dying from. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'd love that too. That seems really hard. <laughs> Um, to add to what David said, I, mean, I think that um, we need to be very cautious, at least in the healthcare space, right? Uh, and that's why we're very, very careful, you know, with our steps. Like David said, we are talking, discussing, identifying, you know, potential, you know, projects, and then to understand, you know, the space. Even we have, you know, expertise in our working group, we are very, very cautious, right? Um, and and making sure that we are working with closely with. Uh, Government agencies around the world is, is is paramount for us because this is driving us uh, to align with you know the uh, regulatory aspect as well. So it's one thing I'm hearing that let, let's maybe take this MedPerf because it's it's tangible and we have the, the expert here uh, uh, as well. Um, it's one thing the kind of the, a valuable ingredient that some other like. Uh, community could uh, contribute is actually data for this um, type of federated testing. Yeah, that's that's the idea. So MetPerf is basically the infrastructure, right? It's basically the plumbing. So mm -hmm. we need basically people like we call champions to drive, you know, efforts in benchmarking. And we are not experts, for example, you know, I don't know, in genomics for prostate, but, you know, someone who's a champion knows, the, you know, the, the society, the community can drive, you know, this effort build a community around it, identify which things are, have a clinical impact directly and build a benchmark around this with AI. And we are providing you know, the tools, right? And you know, our ability to build consortium behind this. Maybe um, there's one more question by Pratap, um, which hints to um, how, how, do you, how do you deal with um, especially medical data sets um with potentially like identifiable information do you request like institutional review board statements um or how do you how do you make the decision yes we accept this data set we know it's fine from the ethics side um yeah did you run into challenges there yeah that's, that's a very good question i mean the way we are basically very careful to make sure you know the the, the data is identified, even if it's less local, same, you know, process. So you need to review, uh, but we, the extra security here is basically that no data leaves from a technical point of view, nothing leaves out, you know, the hospital. And, you know, what I said in the presentation, we also include a human in the loop to be able to approve, review, and then send, you know, basically the, the results back. So yeah. we have a lot of, you know, layers of security. So, um, and it's not just that. I mean, I'd say this is, you know, the if you step back for a moment, the core idea behind DataPerf is we can't build large data sets. But what we can do is virtually build a large data set, 
right? And so, but by construction, the idea is we do not touch the data, right? We are connecting the people who have the data with the folks who have the model with a cognizance that both the data and the model have challenging properties, right? And so, you know, the models need to be protected from the folks with the data. The data needs to be protected with the folks from the model. So everyone's IP is in privacy, uh, is being respected. And so it's in some sense by construction. And that's part of the reason why we're focused very much on federated evaluation. That's much easier, right? You know, you send a model to uh, a hospital in Zurich and you find out that it works poorly. So you're going to get in some like high level summary statistics. Uh, as a model owner, you get no actual individual data. Right. And so by construction, you're sort of protected there. Now, longer term, are we interested in federated learning? Absolutely. But I think, uh, you know, there's always a crawl, walk, run aspect to this across many dimensions. One is the evaluation versus learning side. Uh, and then another is in, in, in what context. Right. So research is a lot easier than uh, clinical work. For instance, and so uh, you know we're we're very uh, humble about what we've done, and and aware that you know there's a lot of different steps we can take to make this a more and more powerful tool over time. Uh, Hopefully, that answers I, the top's question. I I have like two two things. Maybe the the the, the constructive part I, I I keep for later, uh, and and bring it to the, the met metaphysical uh, plane for, for a moment. So you, you talked uh, a bit on this group dynamic and uh, that is ignited when agreeing on a benchmark that everybody pushes in, in one direction and that's how you get innovation and uh, you get progress. And I'm, I'm thinking like, I think in particular in medicine, I, uh, I see this quite a bit that there is often a bit of a divide. There is this, um, I think, more benchmark open part of the community, usually on, on the ML side. And then you have the, the bad clinicians like Matthias um, who say, uh, but I want utility. I want to know that patients are helped. I don't care about uh, your benchmark. And so I think the underlying problem is like, how do we decide on the North Star and how do we recalibrate that? And I'm just curious more actually um, than having like a question like to how this experience was for you guys. Is it complicated? Is it straightforward? Yeah. This is an excellent question because, you know, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to read the paper. We're trying to address that from the very beginning, right? And we are saying basically what you what you're alluding to is basically the, the clinical utility, right? So yes, it's great, you know, I have a model to detect, you know, skin lesions and I'm getting, you know, the sensitivity, specificity, you know, high scores, but that for Matthias doesn't mean a thing, right? So I feel like it's important longer term uh, to be, besides, you know, using performance metrics like this to create and include uh, metrics that measure the clinical uh, utility of, you know, these uh, models, right? Um, and it could be at the variety of this. And, this is what I alluded also in the presentation. How do you measure, you know, health equity as well? It's not just, you know, racial and, uh, you know, gender, right? How do you measure this? And this is a whole basically a community right now that's trying to, to build and uh, build measures around these, you know, concepts. But, you know, I, I agree with you. There has to be more than just accuracy and, you know, ROC curves, right? Because that don't mean a thing to a patient. Yeah, definitely. And I'm just wondering if there is a bit of an embedded dilemma here, um, like because it fits to me, and my views also more from the machine learning perspective. I think most people come with very good intentions, but then you start pulling this threat of benchmarking and you are facing kind of the whole mess of um, healthcare oh. systems and things like that, right? Like it, it and it's beyond, like it, it is beyond are machine you learning usually. Are you referring to egos like, you know, oh, my data doesn't look good on your benchmark or my model doesn't look good on your benchmark? Yeah, th this is true. And then what we offer, you know, also I didn't mention here, we can have a complete anonymized benchmark, which means 
the data providers don't know who are the model owners and the model owners don't know who the data providers are. So you can do it. Depends what you know the benchmark committee, what we call, sets as a policy of the benchmark. Do they want to make it public? If they want to make it public, do they want to make it completely anonymized? Do they want to make it private for whatever reasons? Because, you know, at the end, as I said, Metperf is a, you know, a open source, it's Apache. Anyone can take it and, you know, install it and run it within their premises. Yeah, Alex, I was wondering if you could um, briefly outline if um, how MLC um, differs from other benchmarking initiatives. Um, so we've heard about the Global Initiative Benchmarking Initiative, but there's also the Nightingale um, uh, you know, for, um, in, initiative and others. Uh, do you can you just briefly comment if you, yeah? Are you referring to other medical benchmarks or yeah, are you so referring these, in general? Would be med yeah, these would be medical medical benchmarks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because you know the the majority of you know the benchmarks that you know in the medical space are relying on basically your very very lean uh, public data that yeah. took you know some process to derive, and they are basically in some website repository people yeah. can play with it like a decathlon for example yeah. and now you know about it uh which is great i mean you know this is great but what we're aiming here is that can we move a little, a little bit to the extreme can we move evaluation in real world data and okay. this is something you know of high importance to everybody right including you know regulatory uh, authorities right how can you measure things in the real world and this is what we're aiming for here um and uh, well, as you know, the other benchmarks are, you know, are static. One of the things, and you know, David didn't mention, uh, there's a working group that discusses how to modify the test set moving forward. Right? Because yeah. if you have it static, at the end of the day, it's gonna, at some point in the future, you can, you know, implicitly memorize the, you know, the test. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of challenges in quality benchmarking. Um, and I think that's actually an area where uh, we've seen more and more people turning to us and, and asking for help in that area. Uh, I'll give you an example of the, the um, AI automotive effort that we have. Uh, one of their, you know, they were very inspired by our work in MLPerf, but they said like, look, those aren't real automotive data sets, right? If we want to actually measure performance in a context that is truly relevant it needs to be an automotive setting right it needs to be on a road you need to be looking for emergency vehicles you know i don't care if i can tell the difference between a stove and a stuffed animal i care if i can tell the difference between an emergency vehicle and a pedestrian All right and so once you you have that you know there's a bunch of us who have been thinking okay like let's say we make a lane keeping speed benchmark well maybe we can actually you know branch out and, and make a lane keeping quality benchmark and measure how many excursions do you have, you know, per, per thousand kilometers or whatnot. And so, um, yeah, I think this is an area that historically has been handled very uh, effectively in, in academia, but I think some of the tools that they've produced have also been hard for industry to handle. And one of the big strengths of our organization is, you know, we've got 50 members working on MLPerf benchmarks, I understand what they can and cannot do. And so I think there is potentially a role here for us to look at setting quality benchmarks, you know, in the right places. But, you know, I don't want to do it, you know, I'm not out here to get us involved in in, in competing with other people's works. I, I want to solve problems that are not currently solved where, you know, our ability to do collaborative joint engineering really adds value. So. I, I hope that answers some of your questions. And Alex has talked about a bunch of the challenges, right? You want dynamic, we, we, Dynabench, one of our projects is designed around how do you adversarially test an ML system and make it better over time in that way, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of tools that we've uh, looked at and are thinking about. Yeah, no, it sounds incredibly useful. I might, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out. I, I'm really interested in the adversarial aspects. One question about regulation. Have you been approached by FDA or EMA about collaborating or, you know, for, I, I mean, they must be so interested in this and, you know, for their work and purpose. David, do you want to take this? Or sure. Want... Yeah. Um, so actually very recently, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think we're, 
we talked to the FDA last week and uh, talking to them again in another couple of weeks. And, you know, look, I, um, I, I think if you're in the business of, of doing healthcare yeah. uh, and you're in the U S CMA and FDA are sort of the ultimate authorities. Right. Still and that. so, uh, you know, I think of our role at ML commons as uh, having a broad set of constituency, obviously our members, yeah. the academics, the public regulators and governments. And, you know, we're not here to set regulation, but I think of us because we're not really a political organization and there's too many hands grasping at the tiller to make a nautical metaphor. But, you know, I think part of our role is to talk to people and let them know, hey, you know, this is how you want to think about what the tiller can do for you. Please don't, you know, swivel at 180 degrees, you're going to break the rudder of the ship, right? And sure. so, you know, from a technical advisory perspective, we're happy to engage, uh, love to cooperate with more folks and, and see what we can do. Because ultimately, you know, if we, we can make a tool that helps um, you know, someone said something to me that was very insightful as a non-medical expert. And they pointed out that the FDA was created in the 30s and updated in the 60s or 70s, right, before AI was anything other than science fiction. And so, you know, if our uh, tools, our infrastructure and our expertise can help uh, some of the organizations that are out there, you know, uh, uh, get more comfortable with some of the 21st century tools we have, uh, and help bring them to market, help make them safe, help raise the quality. I, I think that would be fantastic, right? You know, there's nobody uh, who's on team cancer, right? Everyone is united that uh, uh, we would we wish to combat illness. All right. So David put up the challenge to find the the team cancer teammates. Uh, I, I actually <laughs> can find some. So so my my joke all right, is. All right. It, it, you know, there are some actuaries who are on team cancer. All right. All right. Yeah. Before we go on, off on a hardcore tangent, um, yeah. I, I, I want to, um, after this kind of more metaphysical, like North Star, uh, kind of land the, the plane a bit back on the, on the ground in, in, mm -hmm. with respect to like the constructive uh, steps that we could potentially like take after uh, after this meeting. So um, I think there is uh, one opportunity um, coming up that to me like seems like very uh, yeah pressing is is the first uh, global initiative meeting. I think it's in in Riyadh uh, in in November, um, where I would kind of think that. Alex has to present the stuff uh, because there will all be all these health ministries uh, uh, around that sit on data. And if data is the kind of missing piece um, uh, or the valuable piece that uh, you want to ingest in that platform, then, I mean, that should happen for one thing. Then the, the other uh, part uh, that Matthias mentioned, I think could be really interesting, this Nightingale initiative by Zia at Obermeyer, because they, I think, try to do that in the US. They, they hook up uh, a data system to hospitals to have this ingestion engine, basically, for anyone to build this type of thing on top. And the last thing um, I, I, I was wondering about is uh, about this kind of data-centric approach. I mean, I think uh, uh, probably, uh, David, you know the, the the stuff we did with Peter, the, the DMLR and, and Praveen. For, for others, yeah. Praveen is the guy that runs with Lilith and uh, David and, and other people, this, this data perf initiative, um, uh, where we launched a DMLR. It's a new community for data-centric machine learning. Um, a lot of the things come out of MLC, actually, like data perf, like Dynabench, like Croissant. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, wondering there as well, um, maybe I think there's going to be an, another workshop at iClear. Maybe we can... Uh, also have a bit more topical uh, discussions um, than with you, uh, Alex, to, to, to have you uh, uh, kind of share that uh, excellent work so that it becomes wider known and, um, and people can add those pieces that would really uh, yeah, uh, act as a catalyst to, to make, it, make it fly and add value. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to you know, following up. 
All right. Absolutely. So then we are almost at the uh, at the top of the hour. I think there is a networking session um, that we will slowly transition to in this neural network. Uh, I don't know how we enter uh, through the matrix. We will find out. Uh, Julian will guide us the way. Um, uh, are there uh, 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 maybe we do like a quick round of, of closing thoughts? Uh, um, uh, Alex, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you again for the invitation today. Uh, it's fantastic to present to this organization. And, uh, you know, um, hopefully, you know, people grasp, you know, what we uh, want to do here. Um, but, you know, one other thing I emphasize, uh, two things I want to emphasize. Um, like David said, uh, things are built better when you have, you know, open community and transparency. That's number one. Um, and second is like, you know, okay, we present here all these things, but like I said, you know, in healthcare, it's a very challenging field. We have to be very cautious. And we, I'm not saying, you know, we have the magic bullet to solve everything, right? Uh, we have a lot of challenges, technical challenges, legal challenges, and we need to, you know, uh, work on. And this is why we feel like I'm to have the community to be able to support us, right? Um, so these are my two thoughts. Thank you, Alex. Then I hand it over to David and then Matthias. Yeah, I mean, I first of all, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in and listen. And, uh, you know, look, there's so much we have going on in ML Commons from benchmarks to, to the data centric uh, initiatives we're pushing. And, and thank you, Luis, for mentioning those. Like, look, if you're interested, please reach out. You know, we are. Uh, like I said, our goal is making ML better for everyone, and and that's what we want to do. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Also, as a as a physician, I think um, I think it's you know as a physician treating patients, it's it's my responsibility to only use um, like you know models, tools, diagnostics tools where I'm really sure that they work for for everyone, and especially in terms of statistical ML models it'll just be very important to make sure that they work across, you know, different human populations, across different data sets, machines that generate the data and so forth. So I think there's just no way around um, going through an initiative like MLC for, you know, for making sure that your diagnostic or solution or model really works um, in all the diversity that, ex that exists. So um, I think this has been a really, really Great um, presentation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, David, for taking the time. Um, we will be online in the neural network. The audience is already there. You can just ask your questions and um, all of us will be there to respond and discuss. Um, tune in to the next sessions in the AI for Health series. Um, they're on the website of AI for Good. Uh, Luis, thank you for moderating, co-moderating. It's uh, been fun as always. And yeah, so let's move over and uh, see if there's uh, uh, good questions to chat on. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. You see you. Thanks for your time, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool.
This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.